Hello church, this is a nice day. Uh, let me read Psalm 105 to you guys. Um, it says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon His name, make known His deeds among the peoples. Sing to Him, sing praises to Him, tell of all His wondrous works. And that is exactly what we are going to do today. So let's prepare our hearts to worship Jesus. so great Jesus in all things I've seen a glimpse of your heart a billion years still I've been singing how can I praise you enough how can I praise you enough you are you are the Lord Almighty Outshining all the stars in glory Your love is like a wildest ocean Oh, nothing else compares Creation calls all to the Savior We are alive in your praise In earth and sky No one is high our God of wonders you reign Our God, now God of wonders you reign Come on, sing, you are You are the Lord Almighty Our shining on the stars in glory Your love is like a wildest ocean Oh, nothing else compares The Lord Almighty, oh, shining all the stars in glory. Your love is like the wildest ocean. Oh, nothing else compares. Come on, let's be clear. To your name, we lift up all praise. Not to us, but to your name, we lift up all praise. Come on. Not to us, but to your name. Shining all the stars in glory Your love is like a wildest ocean Oh, nothing else
Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. Into the house of all the oikos that are watching this video. You live in us, you are sealed in us because we believe in the good works of our Lord, Saviour, Jesus Christ. And we want to sing about you, we want to praise you, we want to worship you, God. Come on, OC, from wherever you are, let's sing together with us tonight. becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence Lord come on sing Holy Spirit Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the atmosphere your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. By your presence, Lord. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close no thing can compare you're our living hope your presence i have tested and seen of the sweetest of love when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone, oh, your presence, Lord, oh, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your Holy Spirit again. Oh, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come from this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what I has long to be overcome by your presence, Lord.
share for more. You're the only one that satisfies me. Lord, we run. Lord, we run to you, God. Into your loving arms. We're safe and secure in your love. It's an honor to be here today with all of you with this opportunity to share the word. I just wanted to thank Dex and Gershom and all of that for having me along and giving me this chance to share with you today. Um, we might not be the closest, but the times that I've had to talk to these guys and, and walk life with these guys, they've been such an encouragement to my faith and my journey with God. And you guys are so blessed to be able to have them as your leaders. For those of you that don't know me, my name's Matt. I'm currently serving as a supervisor over at FCC in the Vibe Ministry under Arthur. Right now, I'm still a student. I just finished a year at seminary to do my graduate diploma, but now I'm back studying engineering, finishing up my master's. A couple of hobbies I like. I like playing with my dogs. I like gaming a little bit, playing tennis. I like watching movies. I'm a big geek about that. And I just wanted to inform you, as of maybe two weeks ago, I became something I swore to myself I would never do, and that is become a K-drama fan after my girlfriend baited me into watching Crash Landing on you with her. Um, so shout out to all you K-drama fans that are here tonight. But one of the things I love doing the most is actually just sharing and talking about the Word of God with others. So I'm so excited to be able to do that with you guys tonight. And I'm praying that as we talk about God's Word, as we discuss the Scriptures, that you guys will receive it with fertile soil and that you guys might be transformed and renewed and fall in love with God to an even greater extent because of it. So before anything else, how about we just open up in a time of prayer? God, we're so grateful that we can come before you together and your word to just share it, Lord God. We pray that as your scriptures are talked about, may your Holy Spirit come and transform us and meet us where we are, Lord God. May every single one of us here encounter the living God himself tonight, and may every single one of us leave here empowered to glorify you to the fullest. So we want to honour you in this place. We pray that you might be here with us and that you might speak to us through your word this evening. In your most precious name, amen. I understand that you guys have been going through a series on engaging with the Spirit. I know Chris preached an amazing sermon recently, and Gersh just preached an amazing sermon on sanctification and the role of the Spirit to really sanctify us and make us more like Jesus. And I'm going to be continuing that series with you today. In my journey as a Christian, I've often noticed the most life-changing encounters that I've had with the Holy Spirit have often been the moments of quiet and calm. You know, times where I'd just be reading my Bible and all of a sudden the scripture would just come alive to me and speak to me. Or you know, times where I've just sat in prayer and had such a realization of God's love. Or even times where I'd just be sitting there doing nothing spiritual per se, but somewhere in me is this deep long longing and this deep nudge that one day I'd be worshiping God for eternity. But up until maybe last year, beginning of last year, whether I liked it or not, I often found myself hearing other people's encounters, other people's in stories of the Holy Spirit. And it wasn't really what I'd experienced. And I'd often find myself maybe discouraged or even comparing. Whether we like it or not, for many of us here, depending on our background, when we think about the Holy Spirit, we think often about power, about miracles, about how he moved in the book of Acts. Maybe some of us here, because of our background, we're completely scared of it in total. We run away from it thinking it's this voodoo, black magic, like Harry Potter, Shanana, Lord of the Rings sort of things. You know what I mean? Like them YouTube videos where we see a man like wave his hand or fling his jacket and thousands of people fall over. Or like when someone makes someone's leg grow somehow. No. I'm not talking about Star Wars and the Force, but if you would like to see something like that, give Google a little search, Benny Hinn, Sith Lord, you guys will be amazed by what you see. 
But you know what? This skew that we often hear the Holy Spirit being talked about in, I think it even overshadows quieter, more beautiful aspects of the Holy Spirit, which I'd argue are just as important to a life of a believer. And one of these quiet yet beautiful roles of the Holy Spirit that we'll be talking about this evening is the role of the Holy Spirit as the assurer, how the Holy Spirit comes to those that are in Christ and assures them. So that leads me to our text today. If you guys want to turn with me to Romans 8, we'll be picking up exactly where Gershom left off from last week. Um, It's a miracle. Somehow it wasn't planned or anything, but I called him the other night and I found out that my passage was the one directly after that. So we must know that God's doing something and we're doing something right. Um, We'll be talking about verses 15 to 17 of Romans Romans 8, where it talks about the ministries of the Holy Spirit, one of those being an assurer. So reading, For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And if children... Also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him so that we might also be glorified with him. So to help us understand and grasp the weight and the beauty of the Holy Spirit as our assurer, I'm going to be answering three questions and those are going to be my three points for those of you taking notes. So my three questions, what are they? Firstly, what does the Holy Spirit assure us of? Secondly, how does he assure us of it? And lastly, why can we be assured? So starting with the first question, what does the Holy Spirit assure us of? Have you guys noticed that we, in our human nature, in our natural tendency, we hate uncertainty? It makes us uncomfortable, right? Like, I can't be the only one who squirms through movies when the protagonists are in times of danger and you don't know what's going to happen to them. Like, I'm a massive Lord of the Rings fan. I've watched the trilogy at least like 25 times. And still to this day, when Frodo is in the giant spider she loves lair, I completely freak out because he is in danger. Or for those of you that maybe are a little uncultured and haven't watched Lord of the Rings, what about Avengers? Avengers Infinity War. Who remembers when it ended? Thanos snaps his fingers, everyone disappears, and you're left there thinking, how is it going to get better? But then you realize you have to wait one whole year to find out why. How many of you hated that? Like, come on, why not make it just one single movie? Why do that to us? But I think even we see it today in real life, in the world, even with this COVID-19 situation. People are so uncertain about what's going to happen tomorrow, what tomorrow might bring, what the world is going to be like, and it's driving them to insane extremes. I found out recently from one of my friends in Singapore where the circuit breaker was extended and the uncertainty of it ever ending, the unsureness of if it's ever going to get better, led to the tragedy of a young person taking their life. This is what uncertainty does to us. This is what unsureness does to us. But I think if there's one uncertainty that Christians have grappled with the most till this very day, it is to do with the certainty of their salvation, the uncertainty that they might have of their place in Christ. So what happens when we're unassured? What happens when we're uncertain of this? I think there can be two responses, two ways that this uncertainty might manifest. And let me paint them out to you. The first one is this, using my own life as an example. During my first year of being a Christian, my vision, like some of you may be here today, was very cloudy and filled with many doubts about where I stood. I had just given my life to God after being saved from a life of drinking since I was 14, smoking, parties, clubbing, all kinds of sin, lust and pride. My life was transformed and turned around in February of 2016, yet for many months I still struggled through moments of guilt and shame to do with my past. Questions would come up like, how could I ever have lived like that? How could I ever have been forgiven for that? How could I ever be accepted by God and his people? 
these questions. It led me to fear. It led me to be uncertain. It led me to be unsure, to be hindered. And I felt that everything I was trying to do was to either fix and make up for the mistakes of my past to ensure my place in Christ. It felt like all that I was doing was to fix the sin I caused, the hurt and pain I had caused. And you know what was even worse? When I would fall, when I would sin, when I would make a mistake in the present, it wouldn't lead me to a greater revelation of God's love and forgiveness. Instead, it would lead me away from Him, scared of Him, feeling like I had no place because I could never make up for what I had done. I think this is the first way this uncertainty manifests in Christians. It results in Christians living in doubt, a half-life, never really being able to pursue a genuine relationship with God because they're unsure and uncertain where they stand before Him. Have you ever felt this way? What about the second way? I think the second way, even though more silent and subtle, is just as prevalent and dangerous. Uncertainty about our place in Christ can sometimes lead to a false certainty and the complacency where we don't even realize we're uncertain because we've never been bothered to think about it because we're so comfortable with where we're at. It can lead to Christians who have been coming to church for a while now, who have been doing the right things, believing the things that they've been told since they were young, but complacent with a false certainty of their place in Christ based on what others around them have told them or based on them coming to church each week, participating in cell, too sure of themselves and their morality to even bother questioning at all. And even though we might look at this and on the surface see these two groups as totally different, they're very similar. Why? Because both groups never really pursued a genuine, dependent fervent relationship with God as well. Is this you that I'm talking about? Whether we like it or not, both groups are living a half-life, hindered, uncertain in their own ways. Both groups are not living the life that the Bible calls us as Christians to live. Both groups are missing out on the promised joy and peace and relationship with God that can be found in a true assurance of their place in Christ. Genuine faith, according to Hebrews 11 verse 1, is both with certainty and assurance. We need assurance as Christians. We need it more than ever, more than anything. But that assurance is only found by the Holy Spirit. So what exactly does the Holy Spirit assure us of? We see in Romans 8 verse 15 that we as Christians, as believers, we don't have the spirit of slavery anymore. Instead, we have a spirit of adoption. And what does that spirit testify us of? What does it assure us of? The spirit doesn't necessarily tell us that our circumstances will get better or our struggles will end, or these thoughts we might have in our head will stop, or this battle with the flesh and sin in this life will be easy. No, He assures us of something better. He assures us of this one important truth, that we are now children of God, that we are his heirs, co-heirs with Christ, that we have an inheritance eternally safe and secure in him. He reminds us that even in our sufferings, we have a future glory waiting that we can be joyful in now because we are God's child. He assures us that we are God's child and that is enough. One day, who knows, maybe God in his good and sovereign plan, he's going to break some of us here to the point of nothing, where everything we trusted, everything that gives us security, everything that was certain, everything we were assured of is stripped away. Maybe it's not even that. Maybe it's something today. Maybe you're struggling with like a sin like lust or pride that you can't get rid of and it's making you doubt. Maybe you're going through a difficult circumstance in your family's relationships, your mental health, your identity, and it's bringing up questions. Maybe it's something small, like a nudge of doubt and anxiety in your heart that you know you've been feeling for a while, but you're yet to face it. Maybe you're one of the people that's never realized the need to be assured of your place in Christ. It's just been what you've been doing for the past years, but now you're realizing the importance as I speak these words now. Regardless of what situation or circumstance you are in, 
How comforting is it to know that even in those times, even where everything might seem uncertain, where there's that nagging, that slight questioning and unrest in your heart, that the Holy Spirit comes to assure us and testifies to us of a simple yet profound truth that we are God's children, adopted into his family, righteous before his eyes and eternally secure. How joyful is it to know that that peace that we can have today in any circumstance, whether good or bad, that naturally comes from knowing that we have a heavenly father holding on to us that we can have relationship with. How joyful is it to know that in him is every spiritual blessing right here and right now. We are living as sons and daughters of God. How amazing is that? that we are called to righteousness, called to holiness, called to love, and we have a purpose now for his glory. This is the assurance the Holy Spirit brings us in Christ today and for eternity. What does he assure us of? That we are children of God and everything that being his child brings. So moving on now, what about my second question? How does he assure us? What we're going to find is the passage that we just read, it doesn't only tell us what the Holy Spirit assures us of, but it also shows us how he assures us of it. In the few verses before 15, what we find is, like we've talked about, the Holy Spirit's role to make us more like Jesus. And one of the ways he assures us that we are God's child is that we are turning away from sin and turning to what is good and righteous, like Gershom preached in his sermon last week on dying to the flesh and living by the Spirit. But in verses 15 and 16, it tells us one other way that the Holy Spirit assures us of. The spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. What we have here is a beautiful image explaining and showing us the other way in which the Spirit assures us of our place in Christ as God's children. So what does it mean when it says, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father? Abba is an Aramaic word, which means father. Not just something that is thrown around, but it literally translates to my own father, one's own father. Abba, Father is the same way Jesus addressed God in the Garden of Gethsemane in his moment of greatest despair where he was literally sweating blood right before he was crucified and he cried out and he asked, My own Father, Abba, Father, is there any other way? To cry Abba, Father, or more accurate, My own Father, just as Jesus did, it portrays a deep intimacy and trust, just as a son or daughter would to their own father. It is not a word a stranger, let alone a slave, would use to address someone. So I want you guys to imagine this for a second, okay? So put yourself in this imagination. Like imagine you go up to someone on the street that you've never met before at all and you run up to them and you start crying, Father, Father, my own Father. What's going to happen? One of either two things will happen, let me tell you. Either they're going to start running away because they're so creeped out or you're going to be running away because they're trying to beat you up for being a weirdo. Or you know those times in primary school or high school where you make the cardinal unforgivable sin and you call your teacher mum or dad. And then everyone in the class starts laughing at you, even the teacher and probably the principal outside and everyone's pets at home. Yeah, that's happened to me way too many times. But in the same way, Abba Father is not something you cry out to a random stranger that you've never met before. You be careful who you say it to. You don't throw it around like it's nothing. You say it to the one person who is your own father. Abba Father is a word of intimacy that the perfect son used to cry out to the perfect father in one of his moments of greatest turmoil. And in the same way, we read here and we read in Galatians 4 verse 8, the Holy Spirit works out in us that same cry, Abba Father, my own Father. Abba, Father, I cry out to you, and we do it knowing and trusting that he listens, especially in our moments of greatest struggle. The Holy Spirit testifies to our spirit, and he works with our spirit, assuring us that we are indeed children of God with a deep cry 
and the deep longing and the deepest recesses of our heart that every child of God has for their own father. And we know this to be true. Why do we know this to be true? It's because we would not dare cry this out to a stranger, let alone the creator of the universe who holds all power and authority, who can end our life like that, unless we truly knew that we were his own. We would not dare to do it to him unless we truly knew we were his own. I love how the great, great preacher Charles Spurgeon puts it. He says this in one of his sermons. We who believe in Jesus are all children of God. And we dare to use that name which only a child might use, Abba. And we dare to use it even in the presence of God and say to him, Abba, Father. We cannot help doing it because the spirit of adoption must have its own mode of speech. And its chosen way of speaking is to appeal to the great God by his name, Abba, Father. Search your hearts. Reflect, think, in your moments of deepest trial and turmoil, did you cry out to God knowing that he was your own father and that he was listening? In the busyness of your day, with all the distractions prevalent in the world and in your mind and in your life, do you feel the deep longing, the deep breathing, the deep faint cry of your soul for your own father? Do you feel it? Do you hear it? Is it true of you? Hearing these words, can you respond to them? Well, if you do, if it is true of you, if you can respond to these words, that right there is the Holy Spirit assuring you that you are indeed a child of God. And if you don't, seek God, pursue him, ask him why this is the case, because for a genuine child of God, this will always be true. How does the Holy Spirit assure us that we are children of God? With the cry in our hearts and the longing in our souls for our own Father. So that brings me to my last question. Why can we be assured of this? Why can we actually be assured that we are children of God? Like it makes sense, right? The Holy Spirit assures us that we are children of God through many ways, such as us crying out within us for our Father. But why can we be assured of this for sure? What if it's all fake and it's just me telling myself this? What if it is true, but why am I still struggling in my sin, suffering in my trials and nothing seems to be getting better? What if it is true, but I'm so useless and sinful and I keep screwing up? What if I can lose this place I have in Christ? I think this is the question that might haunt us the most, not necessarily the first two, but this one is of utmost importance because without the why, why can we be assured? What's the point of what we're assured of and how we're assured of it? We need to grasp this. Like I said at the beginning of the sermon, this was exactly how I felt. For some time, I would keep trying to make up for the mistakes of my past, living and thinking that it, wasn't, it was what I could do that made me God's child. These were the concerns, the doubts, the fears I had in my head. And the truth is, what I've described before in my own testimony and what the things I've just listed about, if it's fake and me telling myself, the truth is these are very valid concerns. These are very valid doubts, very valid reasons to not be assured. Because if we were in any other religion, if indeed we could lose our place in Christ, if indeed us being ch like children of God was based on what we did or how much we didn't screw up, we'd actually have every reason to live in doubt and fear. If we could lose our place in Christ, if it was dependent on what we could do, we would have every reason to be in doubt and fear. What we need to realize is this. In our nature, we are sinful. In our nature, everything we do falls short of God's glory, his holiness and standards. Like you think having Asian parents, for those of us that do, you think those standards are high? Well, you look at God's standards. God sets the standards for his children. Guess what they are? For his child to love him with all their hearts, all their minds, all their souls, and all their bodies. And the harsh reality is this. No one, 
No one in all of history, in all of creation, could ever do that for even one second. They could never do that for one second except one. We would never and have never been able to live up to God's standards or meet his standards as our parent. So why can we be assured if, that we are indeed children of God if we could never do that, if this is the case, if we are sinful and all of that? I remember July of 2017, everything changed for me. One day I came before God's word. I had just finished showering, I remember. I was tackling with God with some prayer in the shower and I just felt super convicted to get out and go over and get on my knees in my room. I didn't even have time to put on my clothes. I legit just went there and I opened God's word and I turned to exactly this very book of Romans. And as I read, God made something so evident to me that the scripture came alive to me and he revealed one important, powerful truth that has changed my life till this very day and completely flipped how I viewed my walk with God. I found in that moment the burden, the insecurity and shame of trying to make up for my past left me. The doubt and anxiety I had was lifted and it was replaced with joy, peace, contentment and calm. And let me share with you now what it was that I realized that moment on my knees in my room, open before the word of God in the book of Romans. Why can we be assured? Why can we be assured that we are children of God if we could never meet God's standards? It's because it was never about us or what we could do. It was never about me. It was never about making up for the mistakes of my past or righting my wrongs. It was never about us or what we could do. All throughout scripture, and even more so throughout Romans, we gain this revelation and understanding that we never chose God. Like we were so sinful and depraved, we never wanted him. We rejected him and turned away from him at every moment he tried to reach out to us. And the truth is, even if we wanted to choose him, even if we wanted to reach out to him, we could never choose him or do it. Guys, it was God who made the choice, not necessarily us first. The thing about adoption is this. You don't choose to get adopted. If you're an orphan, you don't have the right to go up to some random man on the street and say, adopt me. I'm adopted by you. You're my father. No, it does not work like that. And when we look into what adoption was, especially during first century AD, when the time of this letter was written, when the time of Jesus was, what adoption was, it was the adoptive father, not the child, choosing, not just randomly, but deliberately, someone to represent his name and to inherit his estate. Guys, it was him who called us, him who chose us, him who deliberately adopted us, despite us never being able to meet his standards. It is the free gift of an earthly father to look at a child, knowing that it's gonna be messy, knowing all the problems that they're gonna to need to work through and all the mess of adoption, knowing that like the massive fees that have to be paid to adopt that child, knowing all of this, looking at them and still calling them his own child. And in the same way, it is the free gift of the father to say, no, your life, your old life is gone. All your debts are canceled. All your mistakes from your past and even the mess and the pain that I know you are still going to cause in the future are not going to be counted against you anymore. You have a new life. You have an inheritance and a purpose now to carry my name. Guys, he chose you. He chose us, the church, deliberately, not carelessly. Ephesians 1 verse 8 says, In full wisdom and understanding, he chose and he adopted and he brought us in. And then he paid the adoption fees in full, right there and right then, by sending his one and only begotten son to live the perfect life that we could never live and to fulfill the standard of being God's child that we could never meet. And then on that cross, he gave up his life he bore the full wrath and punishment of God that was due to us in our place so that we might be forgiven, so that we might be adopted into his family, so that we might have a new life to share in his glorious riches for eternity. 
not as slaves or criminals like we deserved, but as children of God. This is what it means when we say our heavenly father has adopted us. He made the choice. He paid the price. So why can we be assured? Because the one who made the choice is unchanging and the price that was paid in full can never be taken away. That is why you and me, brothers and sisters, we can go through any trial and any circumstance knowing today by the Holy Spirit in full confidence and assurance with such joy and peace, with such certainty of the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ. That is why we are able to glorify him to the fullest, knowing that we have a heavenly father who listens, who comforts, who affirms, who guides, who cares, who loves us today one who we have relationship with and one who will be worshipping for eternity without sin or suffering anymore. That is why we can be assured. So let me end just with one more quote from one of Charles Spurgeon's sermons. Let it sink in and let it speak to you and minister to you today. Does your spirit cry in that way tonight? Even if you be in the dark, yet if you cry for your father, you will soon be in the light. There is no need to be distressed with any form of doubt, so long as the spirit makes this continual breathing. Abba, Father, show thyself to me. Do what thou wilt to me. Let me taste thy love. Let me at least bow under thy hand. Does your spirit cry that way tonight, guys? Even if you're in the dark, if it does, you will soon be in the light. There is no need to be distressed. There is no need to have doubt, just as long as the Holy Spirit assures and works in you that deep cry, Abba, Father. So what does the Holy Spirit assure us of? He assures us that we are children of God. How does he assure us of it? Through testifying to us that we have a Father who we cry out to. And why can we be assured of this? Because God made the choice, he doesn't change, and he paid the adoption fees in full. So let's pray. God, we thank you for the word that you've provided us tonight, Lord God. And we're praying, Lord God, that as people have heard it, Lord, they might be convicted and changed, Lord God, for your glory. We're praying for people in this place that might be having feelings of doubt or fear or uncertainty about their place in Christ. We pray that, Lord God, tonight your Holy Spirit might come and minister to their souls and assure them that there is no fear, there is no doubt, Lord God, but you are assuring them that they are your own. We even pray for those that might have never thought about this or seen the importance, Lord God. We're praying tonight, might, might their eyes have been open, Lord God, open to the beauty, open to the joy and the peace that is promised in a life assured of you and with you, Lord God. So, Lord God, we pray for these people, this church, Lord God. Might you bless them going forward. Might you draw them to you every single day, Lord God, in great dependence. And might you show them your love more and more so that they might love you more and more, all for your glory, Lord God. We pray this in your most precious name. Amen.